there's always a new challenge. There's always something you have to figure out. You've got an unhappy client. You've got a, I'm going to say, a bad contractor that wants to take too many shortcuts. Uh, or you've got some problem with a, an, an engineering consultant. And, and uh, so each one of those things, whatever they are, is a new challenge. And you have to be quick on your feet to figure out, how am I going to deal with this? Hello and welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we talked with Patrick McLamey, F-A-I-A. He worked his way up from junior designer to CEO of HOK, a global architectural engineering and planning firm where he worked for 50 years. Since 1955, HOK has designed hundreds of major projects, including the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in DC, Apple's first major campus in Cupertino, the George Bush Presidential Library in Texas, Orioles Baseball Park in Baltimore, the expansion of Sarin's Dulles Airport, the Udvar Hazy Air and Space Museum in near Dulles Airport, DFW Airport in Dallas, and reimagined LaGuardia Airport. A uh, self-taught executive, McLamey loved designing a firm just as much as he did designing buildings. He's best known in the design industry as the creator of the McLamey Curve, which advocates front-loading effort during the design process to catch errors early. A pioneer in leveraging technology to support design quality, he is currently chairman of Building Smart International, where he pushes tirelessly for the global implementation of Building Information Modeling, or BIM. He is also an author. His new book, Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm, the People, Stories, and Strategies Behind HOK was just released by Wiley and is now widely available. I really enjoyed this conversation with Patrick. I hope you enjoy it. It's got a lot of great information from someone who's been highly successful in their field and has had a lot of influence. So enjoy. Mr. Patrick McLamey, thank you so much for joining us today. It's uh, quite a pleasure to be able to speak with you. Congratulations on your book. I hope the tour and everything is going well with that. Well, uh, thank you. It's really good to be here. The book tour uh, has turned from a physical book tour with flying in airplanes to different cities to a virtual book tour. Everything's electronic since we're all sequestered. Sure. But I'm having a ball with it anyway and enjoying myself. That's really nice that you uh, you get to do this and not have to uh, be exhausted by so much travel. It, yes, indeed. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I had travel throughout my career um, millions of miles, something close to 4 million miles wow. of travel around the world. I expected to do some more of it, and I, uh, but this is actually pretty cool yeah. uh, to be able to travel virtually and meet people uh, electronically and, uh, and get my message out about the book and about HOK and uh, why I wrote the book and so on. So it, it's, been, it's been good. Great, great. Yeah, I... Uh, I asked a, a few of my clients, uh, owners of some of the firms that I work for occasionally, I told them who I was going to be talking to and if they had questions. And they were like, oh, wow, I've got to buy that book. That's great. Uh, well, of course, I'm, I'm very happy if they buy my book. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, perhaps after the this podcast, uh, they'll be more interested yet because I will, I'm, I'm happy to share lessons that I learned in the book, uh, uh, in HOK, that I shared in the book. So um, at least it's a taste of what the book contains. Sure. So let's start off with uh, just a couple personal questions first so people can get to know you a little bit. Um, how and why did you end up going into the design field? Okay. Well, that, it, it started off for me when I was a little boy. My grandfather was a carpenter, and he built houses for people. And uh, I... Uh, he had in his kitchen a homemade drafting board. For those who don't know what it is, that was a softwood board that you that you fixed pieces of paper to with thumbtacks, no drafting tape yet, right? Uh, so you could draw a plan. And I was fascinated. But he had a hand handmade T square and a store bought triangle. And uh, and and occasionally he would let me draw on that drafting board. And I thought I w that was the most wonderful thing to be able to draw a house plan. And so I decided then and there, I must have been five or six, I wanted to be a carpenter. 
And it was only later that I learned that actually the people that draw on the pieces of paper are called architects. Right. And uh, so I grew up knowing that I wanted to be an architect, although I had a real love for carpentry and working with my hands as well. So uh, for me, the decision was made um, actually before I think I was in the first grade. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's amazing the influence that a father has on the formation of little boys and what what they think they're going to do or want to do someday. I'll, we'll actually, my background is in architecture. I have my master's in practice for a little bit, but ultimately went into architectural photography. But I'll sketch out little design ideas for uh, like forts, and then we'll build them. And so I found my boys, they'll draw little fort ideas, and then they'll go make them, and then they'll come back and show me. It's like, oh, wow, cool. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Um, so, uh, at, at a philosophical level, what, what is your underpinning philosophy, uh, to life design and leadership? Like what is the foundational thing that guides you in, in kind of the formation of your principles of those things? Well, Trent, I, um, when I started this early love affair with architecture, I grew up and was educated to believe, and I still believe that design, architecture, design should play a central role in our society, Mm -hmm. that a a really civilized nation or society needs great design. Uh, I was taught that architects uh, set the stage on which uh, people act out their lives. We, we, uh, and we should live and work and go to school and get healed and so on in noble buildings and our city should be noble places. Hmm. Uh, I grew up believing that, and I still believe it. The reality is, most of our cities are not that noble. A lot of them are pretty grim places. A lot of our suburbs are cookie cutter, um, one size fits all. And um, the work of the architect has been pushed very much, instead of in central stage, it's very much on the side. Mm And um, I made it my business in HOK first, and then in my involvement with an organization I helped to start 25 years ago called Building Smart. I want to push design back, take over that lost territory and get design back at the center where I think it belongs. Mm -hmm. I think our children should go to school in wonderful buildings that are beautiful, functional, but inspirational. Uh, I want our, um, I want our, uh, our, our uh, city centers to be filled with beautiful buildings and with beautiful spaces between the buildings, so that people can feel noble. I literally mean that word noble. They can feel noble when they go to the city center to go shopping or conduct business. Same thing with going through an airport. Instead of feeling like you're in a cattle car just being processed through. Can it be a, become a, a very dignified, civilized experience hmm. where you want to be there because it's a beautiful place and it's not only beautiful to look at, but it's beautiful in the way it works. Hmm. And I think a lot of people over the years have forgotten or maybe never had the distinction between something looking pretty and something working well. But I have, when I've given talks about this, I've always held up my my iPhone and I said, here's an example of a piece of great design driven by Steve Jobs, who I think was a real visionary. The iPhone literally transformed the way people worked and lived and mm-hmm. communicated and got news and information and took photos and so on. So it was not only good to hold in your hand and good to look at and how it fit into your pocket, but it was useful. It was simple to use with maybe one thumb or just with your voice. That's great design. Mm. That's great design. There, there's a, uh, there is a connection to truth in design and, and life that we, I think we intrinsically understand as we do with music. So if there is a, if there is a good song that you connect with, it's because that song speaks to some truth in your life. And it, it encourages you to connect with that truth and emulate it 
in a way of singing along with that song. It encourages you to move and verbalize in that manner. And I had a conversation with an architect yesterday that went really deep, and I've, I found some truth in it, that uh, here in Biddeford, Maine, where we're at, we have a lot of brick buildings. And the bricks, they're all the same, but they're not, right? They're uniform, but they're each individual. So it's kind of like people, right? Well, we all look the same from a distance, but you get up close, we're all different. And when you spot a fake brick wall, there's something in your core that resonates with truth that, that rejects that because every single brick in a fake brick wall is stamped out in exactly the same. It looks like a reproduction of a group of people, but they're all Patrick McLamey rather than a, a group of people, right? And That's so there's, a scary idea. Yeah, <laughs> or, or a Trent <laughs> Bell group. So there's, there was such a beautiful moment of understanding of why we see things like vinyl or a fake brick wall. And at some deeper level, we reject that and it makes our skin crawl. It might meet some needs, as in here's a covering that'll last forever and it's cheap, but there's a truth, there's a depth to that truth that we reject at our core. And that, that's a really interesting uh, realization for me to come across that, that kind of relates to what, what we're talking about here. Yes, and I think that the role of the architect if the architect is at the center of things and is working as a designer, mm -hmm. one of the things that always has to be, uh, we always have to pay attention to is, well, what can people afford? How much should something cost? Sure. And I'm a great believer that good design or great design even doesn't have to be expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, great design is thoughtful. And uh, great design... Um, uh, you know, the cost of the finished materials on a building, the bricks on the exterior um, or the the interior, the kind of paint you're using, so on. Um, those things are only a sliver of the true cost of a building. And what has happened in our industry, uh, the industry of designing and building things, is that without thinking about design from the very beginning, when you first start out with that blank sheet of paper or the blank computer screen, if you're not a good skilled practitioner, you can design a building that that is um, that doesn't allow for that last 10% to be expended on good finishes, on the real bricks, for example. If you're thoughtful about it from the beginning, you can actually have both. Uh, it may mean that the building, you think about the building differently. It may mean that you find ways to be more efficient with things you don't see, like the structure usually. Or uh, maybe there are certain ways of making the area of the building more useful or more efficient. But uh, architects that end up having their finishes degraded uh, degrades the whole idea of what design is because the finishes are the things that you can see and touch about a building. That's your your vis visceral, visual and visceral experience. And if those things are degraded, then uh, then design gets lost. Right. So that that uh, that's interesting because I my wife and I did that with the design of our house without intentionally thinking about that from the beginning. I knew that we had to keep the form simple, the roof line simple. Um, because we wanted to be able to afford a, a, a large, uh, expansive windows to connect with the land that we were on uh, and, you know, to be able to afford that, but to not uh, undercut that and be able to not have, you know, natural cedar on the siding or a metal roof. And so it, it, it limited the other parts. The structure needed to be simple. The roof lines needed to be simple. And so instead of going into debt, if you will, for these other things or making a, a complex thing that then took away the windows or took away the natural siding or took away the metal roof. We, we were looking at the totality of it and said, we're going to have to restrain ourselves here in simple quality so we can have simple quality here as well. And, and kind of look at the totality of it and not go overboard and come up short later. Yes, um, I think you did it exactly the right way. Too often, architects or designers who approach uh, the design of something start out with the idea of, well, if it's too simple, 
it won't be somehow interesting. And we need to make it complex. And uh, if you look back in, in antiquity, the simplest buildings are actually the most elegant. The simple mm -hmm. forms, the Parthenon, is a simple gable-roofed building, but oh, is it beautiful. Perfect yeah. proportions, fantastic uh, materials, great detailing, and so on. The pyramids of Egypt, they're iconic. That pyramid form, you know, has resonated down through the, 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 the eons of civilization. Um, so it doesn't have to be complicated. Simple buildings are often the best answer. And in fact, if the buildings are too complicated, I can almost guarantee you that not only will your, your finishes suffer, but the building's very complexity will take away from the simple ability to appreciate uh, really good design. Good design is often the simplest answer. Right. That's a, that's a great answer. You're, you're giving me, yesterday I got goosebumps and today I'm getting goosebumps. This is great. <laughs> um, all right. So a little more professional level discussion on, on some of the, uh, some of the points that we could talk about from your book that I've read parts of it and some of your, uh, some of your articles that you've written that have been very, uh, insightful and interesting. And they all delve into areas where, where I am not, um, naturally talented leadership, um, Leadership is something that uh, I've never been a follower or a leader. I'm a weird combination of something, but uh, you seem to have naturally uh, gr you you seem to naturally grow from designer into uh, leadership with those natural skills and ability. And so this is very interesting uh, for me to read about and to hear about, as well as my my father teaches uh, or taught church leadership at the university level. So I've I've been on the side of a lot of conversations of these things. So it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting, but, um, so first of all, uh, what are three distinct ways of diversifying to recession proof your firm? And you have some interesting antidotes from the founding of HOK that, that were. Yes. Um, yeah, the founders, um, HOK is the name we use today, but the H O and K were people. Mm -hmm. George Helmuth was the H. Uh, and he was the real driver of, of uh, he wanted to create a new kind of architecture firm, one that would not uh, have boom and bust cycles like so many practices have. And he, he, he got this lesson uh, early in his life. He was the son of an architect in St. Louis, Missouri. His father and his uncle, his father also called George Helmuth, and his uncle Harry Helmuth, had a firm in the early part of the 1900s called, what else, Helmuth and Helmuth. And as he was a boy growing up, he also wanted to be an architect. But the experience of seeing his father and his uncle struggle with their practice uh, stuck with him and shaped his life, really. The family, the Helmuth family, had times of plenty when the, the firm had work and they had uh, money to spend on things that they needed. And they had lean times when the firm ran out of work. And uh, he, he saw a number of these cycles. He called, it, uh, he called it being on a roller coaster. First you're up and then you're down. And then you're up again and then you're down again. And when he, he went to Washington University, which is a very fine private university in St. Louis, graduated with a Master of Architecture uh, degree, went to, went to Europe for a year, traveled and studied at the École des Beaux-Arts in France, came back and thinking he would join his father and his uncle's firm. Then there was this thing called the Great Depression. He had the misfortune to graduate in 1931. The Great Depression was already on. His father and his uncle could not hire him. So that was another searing experience. So George Helmuth, the younger, uh, wrangled a job as a junior architect with the city of St. Louis. And for the next seven years, he designed park benches, comfort stations, and bus stops. And uh, he said, you know, I love architecture, but there's got to be some way to have a stable practice where you can do something besides lurch from crisis to crisis. So there are lots of other chapters, but he finally, um, 
he began to think up deeply about this, and uh, he came up with some insights. He noticed that his father and his uncle's practice, when they had work, they would hire draftsmen. And in those days, they were draftsmen. They were men who were good on the drafting board. No computers yet, and almost no women in the practice. And about the time that the project was being finished, those draftsmen had been trained to the way the Helmuth brothers wanted them to work. So they, they had a more efficient operation. But when the project was over, unless there was a new project coming in the door, they laid all those people off just back down to the two brothers. So the, what Helmuth saw, George Helmuth the Younger, they lost the benefits of the training. And they had to start over again with each new project as if they were another startup firm. So they never really got the firm off the ground. They did some good work over the years, a uh, few notable projects, but never really made any substantial impact on society. So George Helma thought about this and decided that the most important thing that you could do to have a successful practice was have, attract, and keep talented people. The word keep is the key here, because he said if you can keep them long term, you can train them to be better and better and better at their work. Well, how do you do that? You have to have steady work. So his second insight was you had to have full time marketing. There, you had to have somebody always looking for the next work, the next project, the next uh, job to keep those talented people busy. And his third insight was perhaps the most important which was to diversify the work of the practice. Most firms in the time that he was growing up and in the, and in the pre and post-war years were busy designing schools because there was a baby boom in the United States. And uh, it would have been very simple and very easy for architects to just concentrate on designing schools because there always seemed to be another school project, one after the other after the other. Helmuth saw, you know, schools are going to finally run out when the baby boom is over. And then what? So when he formed the firm, HOK, and there's a nice long story about that, he said to his partners, Gio Obata and George Casabon, who are interesting characters in their own right, you guys can design and produce schools. Obata was the designer. Casabon was the production architect. I'm going to go out and look for everything else to design. So he found a prison project. He found a little hospital. He found an airport to design. He found uh, many different kinds of building types. His idea was if the school market is down, maybe the hospital market will be up in the simplest terms to diversify. And then, gee, why don't we open another office so that if the work in St. Louis is slow, Maybe we can keep our good people in St. Louis busy by having them work on a project that is in San Francisco. This was just at the age when air travel made this possible. So Helmuth was one of the pioneers of using the airplane to travel from one place to another looking for work. Uh, in those early days, it was he sometimes impressed clients just by showing up at their doorstep. A client in New York or Washington, D.C., to have somebody come fly all that way to uh, talk to them about what they needed for uh, architectural services. So diversity, the diversity idea, first of building type, then of geography, were two, two diversity principles. There was one more, diversity of services. Helmuth re recognized that most architects, when they get a job, they give away 40 or 50% of their fee to the engineers, the landscape architect, the interior designer, and so on. He said, you know, we should really offer all of these services, not just architecture, because clients may need one or another. So maybe if they don't need us for architecture, maybe they need us for interior design or engineering or landscape architecture or planning and on and on. So diversity of building type, geography, and service was a key, key insight. He had one other insight, his fourth, which was that in those in the early days of his father and his uncle, both partners, both Helmuth brothers, as typical of the time, they did it all. They, they solicited for work. They designed buildings. 
and they oversaw production of those buildings, and they oversaw construction as the architect rolled during construction. Nobody focused on any one thing. Helmut's big insight was, I want a firm, he said, that has people that are focused on their own job. I want to focus on marketing because I think I can get really good at it. And he picked Gio Obata, who was a young designer, a Japanese-American born and raised in San Francisco, as the designer, and George Kassebaum, super organized um, uh, man to, to lead production. And he said, let's each focus on a different thing. Number one, we won't be competing with each other. But number two, you know, if you do something the, every day, after a while, you're going to get pretty good at it. So uh, that was a revolutionary thought that you would have people focus just on marketing, just on design, and just on overseeing production. But that's how the firm was evolved uh, by his thinking. Now, there's lots of other chapters of what happened, but in the unlikeliest of places, St. Louis, Missouri, the firm grew to become one of the world's largest and uh, continuing to be one of the most diversified practices. Last, the last year I was there, 2017, HOK worked in more than 80 countries around the world on every continent except Antarctica. Um, and so uh, diversity is a huge thing. I could add one more thing, Trent, if I could. Sure. Diversity of people. He didn't think about it in these terms, but uh, over the years, the firm has evolved from almost all men to now today, HOK is roughly 50-50 men and women. And uh, the firm began its its um, existence with one minority partner, Gio Obata, Japanese-American. And today that trend continues. We have minorities and women in positions of real leadership around the firm. The uh, One of the things that strikes a note with me that you just spoke spoke of uh highlights one of my early failures um so i went into partnership with a with a good friend of mine to start an architecture firm right out of school he had it we went to high school together same age same grade i went and surfed for a while and had fun he went straight into architecture school and he was he's you know notes to the grindstone kind of guy and so he graduated, uh, or he did his IDP and everything else, and became an architect about the time that I was finishing architecture school. We started a firm, Johnson & Bell, at the time. And we lasted about three years, but there was too much competition for uh, wanting to do the same things. We both had too much of the same interest, as far as we both really enjoyed design and, and wanted to focus on that when there was all these other things that neither of us were very interested in. So it just, it led to a natural conflict. And I, I don't think I'm that great of a person to uh, have a partnership with. I'm not, I'm not a great group team player. I'm, if, if I were in the military, I would definitely be more of a sniper than anything else. You know? <laughs> so I, I need to be able to do my own thing, but, uh, yeah, that's uh, I've found that just from my own experience to to find that diversity of interest, and so you're not competing within a firm like that. That that's that's some great advice, um, and connects with my experience. Uh, one of the questions I had from one of my clients applies to what you were just speaking of. Um, if we could go there, uh, the the so. Diversification for a small firm is so very hard, going from a small firm that maybe does residential to maybe trying to dip their toe into commercial, right? Um, it's so very hard. Uh, what advice would you have for a small firm looking to break into new markets? Yes. Okay. That's, that's an excellent question. And um, I think it's, it's challenging that there are, there are disadvantages uh, for the small firm in that if you're going to, let's say, move from residential work to commercial work, mm -hmm. um, it probably takes a different skill set. And it takes, uh, Helma said, to open a new market like that takes five years yep. uh, to cultivate a client group, 
to learn what uh, what's important to them about designing for the, for them and and to win that first commission and to get good enough at serving that client um, so I do think it takes if you're one person firm I think you can do it if you're an extraordinarily good one person firm if you have 10 people you might be able to put one person into a position of focusing on just that marketplace mm -hmm. um, uh, but it it is it, it's certainly a challenge but I think it's something that any firm would be wise to to do because no one marketplace uh, sustains itself over a career or a lifetime of practice. Sure. And if you want your firm to be strong and give you a long uh, career, and then if you want to be able to sell or give your firm to the people that work for you uh, uh, and, and, and have it continue on, um, you have to have some way to sustain that practice. Mm -hmm. So being diverse in the building types is a certainly a good first step. Having said all that, let me just say there is a, a fundamental advantage that a small firm does have over a large firm. You know, HOK has close to 2,000 people. Wow. And when HOK, if you're going to try to turn that big aircraft carrier of a firm, it, it's not nimble. HOK can be turned, but it takes time, years. A small firm, let's say of 10 or less, the principal or principals can decide on Tuesday that they want everybody to adopt Revit. And on Wednesday morning, everybody starts to learn Revit. And if they're determined, they can turn on a dime. So the flexibility of a small firm is an asset. Uh, the other thing I think that small firms can and should think about is has to do with technology. Uh, in the same way that the Helmuth used uh, Dras the Helmuth and Helmuth firm used Draftsman to help them with the work. Small firms can actually, I think, use technology to help extend themselves when they have more work and help to throttle back when they don't by the following. Maybe you've got your best buddy that you went to architecture school with in the next town over. Maybe you can find ways to share staff between two firms by basically buying staff time. Hmm. And they people don't have to move. They don't have to relocate to your town or to make long commutes. They can just hook on by uh, the use of technology and become, uh, become a member of your team for that period of time. So those little ideas about borrowing staff, to me, trained staff is the key to everything. Uh, that if you've got a good people, maybe your, your buddy in the next town over has somebody that he really doesn't want to lay off because they're so good, he knows he'll never get them back yep. once they're gone. So maybe this is a way to, to make that work. So there are some arrangements like that that are now much more doable with technology. Now, what is, to listen to you talk and come up with ideas uh, gives me an impression that if you were a sailor, you might be a little bit more of the Australian mindset than the British mindset. The Australians... Uh, they, they're a little more out of the box where the British are far more ridiculously prepared ahead of time. It seems like you think a little more out of the box, uh, compared to adhering to a set guideline. And that's, what's going to be as we move forward. Uh, do you, do you find yourself thinking in one way or the other and figure on the benefits or drawbacks of that mindset? You know, um, that's an excellent question again, Trent. Um, I think I'm probably more like the Australians in one respect, that uh, there's always a new challenge. There's always something you have to figure out. You've got an unhappy client. You've got a, a job with a, with a, I'm going to say, a bad contractor or a contractor in trouble that wants to take too many shortcuts. Uh, or you've got some problem with a, an, an engineering consultant and, and uh, so each one of those things, whatever they are, um, each one of those things is a new challenge. And you have to be quick on your feet to figure out, how am I going to deal with this? So uh, good leaders need to be flexible thinkers and figure things out on the fly. And I don't care how big your firm is or how small, everybody is faced with 
has been faced with one of these challenges, at probably quite often actually. I had plenty. I'll just I'll give you one little one. Uh, actually, it was a big one. We had a major project for to design a new airport for Doha, Qatar. And Qatar is a Middle Eastern country on the Arabian Gulf that's small. It's um, probably 100 miles long uh, with one city, Doha. But they happen to sit over the largest pool of natural gas on planet Earth. So they have a lot of money. And they wanted to be like Dubai, their sister city, and have a nice fancy airport. So uh, they picked HOK to design it. That's another good story. But that's not the story today. The airport was under construction. And this was just at the time when the architects were transitioning from CAD software to BIM software. We hadn't yet made the transition to Revit three-dimensional software, but our contractor had. So the first thing the contractor did, uh, this was a combination of a Japanese, a German, and a uh, Indian contractor to, do, to, do, to build this a $9 billion airport. The first thing they did, even before they set up their jobs, uh, job site and so on, they hired another firm to model our building in three dimensions. They discovered all the mistakes, the conflicts, things didn't fit well, and so on. And they inundated our staff at the job site. We had a staff of first five, and then 10, and then 20, and we were getting killed with RFIs, requests for information. They were having a field day, making uh, just overwhelming the architect in preparation for a major claim for extras with the, the client. So the client, we, we became very concerned and uh, called me. I was in San Francisco. The project was in Doha, which is halfway around the planet. Uh, we want you here and we want you here day after tomorrow to answer these questions from us. So I flew all day and all night to get there, basically. And I got what we would call in HOK a good wire brushing. Um, they pinned my ears back and said, how could you be so stupid as to let the contractor run circles around you? We're, we're drowning in RFIs here and your staff is not able to keep up. What are you going to do about it? And uh, I just listened. And finally, he said, what are you going to do about it? I said, I don't know exactly, but I, I do know this. You're right that we haven't kept up. Give me 10 days and I'll be back with a proposal for what to do. And uh, the 10 days happened to span over the Thanksgiving holiday. So I flew back. I did have Thanksgiving, but it was a long, hot week of figuring out what to do. And I came back after Thanksgiving, met with the same group. And, and, and in Doha, like Arab countries, they have a very formal meeting room with people sitting in easy chairs with a little table between them. And they have a tea boy, literally a young, young man that brings little teacups and pours tea. And nobody talks until they have their tea in front of them. So I got back the second time. The little tea boy came around and poured tea. I didn't touch mine. And I said, what we need to do to solve this is double our staff at the field. And I'm not going to ask you to pay us for that. I'm going to just ask you to agree that that, that you'll allow us to do it. We need more room at the job site. The job site, instead of being one trailer, was a whole complex of trailers all hooked together. There's also 115 in the shade. So you need those trailers to be air conditioned, believe you me. So um, within two weeks, I had other HOK people pulled together. We sent 25 more people to Doha to live and work indefinitely to catch up on those RFIs without asking the client to pay the bill. That was just, why didn't, why did I, you know, that goes against all orthodoxy because it was costing us literally millions of dollars. Um, the client was overwhelmed with our response because it was over the top helpful. I didn't mix up being helpful to the client with 
the necessity of saying, well, now, gee, can't you, can you please pay us for this? That happened about eight weeks later when the client came back and said, you know, we're really happy with this. We'd like to ask you to submit us a proposal to get paid for this because we know it's hurting your firm. And we have an extension to the airport that we'd like you to design also. So uh, that's not in any playbook. You couldn't make that up um, and apply it to anything else. You just have to, that was by, let's say, gut feel of the moment. I'm going to fix this problem at our expense. After we've gotten things under control, maybe we'll have a conversation about money. Um, so that's the Australian side. There is another side to architecture, and I think most firms get really trapped by this, which is the design side, which everybody loves, is, is of necessity free-flowing. Uh, design is, a, is, a, is an act of creation. It's often with small groups or even with one person. And if it's done properly, it's a patient search for the best answer. There's another piece of the practice, which is at once that design is established, it becomes more and more rigorous, requiring more people who do follow the, the British sailing rules, who do know that yeah, you've, yeah, got, yeah. you've got to check this and double check that and, and right. so on. So it's both. And how the heck can you do both in one firm? Well, George Helmuth's idea was you're going to have one guy that focuses on the free-flowing ideas and designing and another man or woman who's really focused on uh, we've got to follow all the rules and have a checklist and, and so on. So um, I think a small firm, even if it's one partner, maybe if you're a sole practitioner, you've got to have both, both sides of yourself to do that. That's why sole practitioners are so difficult to make work because you have to be both sides of that equation. Yeah. Far better uh, if you have at least two people. Yeah. And hopefully they're, they're diverse in just those two people. That, well, that, and, again, and again, I'm sorry, uh, Trent, just to, to come back to that example, the Helmuth and Helmuth firm that George Helmuth grew up under, both of those men conflicted all the time. They both loved to design. They wanted, and they both loved to get their own clients. So they were there as a marriage of convenience, not as a marriage of, of uh, equals doing different things. That was another key insight of Helmuth. If you're really going to get good at something, you've got to focus on that as your main job. Well, that, that's a, that is a really good antidote. Uh, I was just about, I had in I have a hard time keeping track of the questions I want to ask and not interrupt people. And the question I had was, how do you deal with uh, someone that you've let down a client? And you you naturally answered that. So that's that's really interesting. I, uh, that that's a great story of how to uh, think on your feet and manage in in an incredibly uh, high stakes situation. I. Uh, I don't know that I would have wanted to have been in your place, <laughs> but you handled that it well. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, so uh, the next question I had here, why architects should not develop a personal style? And this is an interesting question to me because I have found in photography, in the business of more of a sole proprietor, as a photographer, I have one employee who is my... Uh, retoucher and studio manager and he's very much does an incredible job of the things I don't excel at so that works well but what I have found is that specialization into simply architectural photography to not advertise that we do portraits or weddings or anything else like that we simply do this one thing but in doing that one thing I have a diversity of clients and in project types um, but why should a should an architect not develop a personal style in your opinion Yes. Okay. So, um, of course, I knew that that question would come up. Sure. <laughs> uh, here, here's my, here's my thought about it, Trent. Um, I think there's a confusion in our in our profession, in the design profession, about style, the difference between style and design. Mm -hmm. um, there have been styles of building types throughout the years, uh, Gothic and 
re Renaissance and classical and, um, you know, Cape Cod and, and so on. Those are styles. And it's okay to like a style. It's, it's fine. There are some very good styles. But the, the real service to a client, you got to remember, these aren't for us. These, these projects are for clients. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that pay the bills. And if you start out with a style or a, a design theme in mind, your client may love it, they may hate it, but you also might miss in your zeal to put your style out there what the client really needs. You and I just talked earlier about um, designing you designing your own home or you and your wife were intent on having really good finishes inside or and outside, mm -hmm. but that caused you to to uh, in order to fit your budget, caused you to adopt a very simple form for your house. And um, I think a lot of too many architects have some style in mind. I, I want to get the makeup on and the lipstick before I actually have the bone structure and what this body is going to do. What this what is this building going to do for this client? How is it going to help them live better, work better, heal better, or whatever their their mission is? So I think that the best designs come without so many preconceptions. It comes from listening to what your client needs and finally discovering the right design by doing that. That's been a hallmark of HOK that the people have said the firm has no recognizable style. And I think that's true. You might say it's a kind of a modernist style, but uh, HOK has been filled with People, different people designing different things for different clients. It's all different. Mm -hmm. And one of the goals, frankly, has been to have that different, to celebrate that. Uh, good quality design means design, in, in HOK speak, design from listening to the client and designing from the, the client needs outward and discovering what that design should be mm -hmm. uh, instead of designing from the outside in which I think a lot of architects do. And I, I, I have strong opinions about it and think that the architects, the architectural magazines and the architectural critics have hurt the profession by obscuring the true reason, the true purpose of, of great design into something that's, uh, how do you apply the makeup on the outside of the building, the right. lipstick and so on. And I think that as long as we have that uh, mentality about what great design is, we will have architecture off to the side instead of at center stage in shaping the the uh, the environment where we all live and work and so on. Right. Yeah. That uh, I insisting on high quality design rather than a personal style of design. It seems like what you're saying. Precisely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I get that. Um, so you had uh, a very interesting antidote again with uh, the birth of sustainable design and its potential for today and how HOK kind of came to that, that moment of realizing this is where we are going to kind of start uh, a focus or, or invest in. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a good story. Um, you know, when uh, when I was when I was in school in the early days of architecture, sustainable design was not thought about. Uh, good design, um, but not sustainable. So I didn't know the word. I didn't know what it meant. And um, when I was, uh, let's see, uh, maybe uh, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, in the 90s, we had a meeting in St. Louis. And again, one of the things that was interesting about HOK and, and continues that way is we didn't just meet in St. Louis. We met a, as the firm matured. We began having board meetings and firm-wide meetings in different offices so people could get to know one another, visit each other's offices, and meet each other's staff and so on. But this meeting was back in St. Louis. And uh, one, of, one of the – we often got a speaker – to, after our board meeting, a speaker would give us a lecture on something. And this time, the speaker was the head of the Missouri Botanical Garden. Missouri uh, 
the, the Missouri Botanical Garden is world famous. And the man who led it gave us a lecture about the relationship between the world of people and the natural world. And he stood up in front of us for maybe 45 minutes, started with the whole earth. He said, you know, the earth is ab about uh, 25 miles thick, this little thin surface around the edge of the earth in the lower atmosphere and a little bit down in the, down in the oceans and a little bit down in the, in the ground. That's where all the life is. And he said, it's, it's incredibly interlinked. And everything that you do, everything that, that anything anybody does affects everything else. And he said, we're just beginning to understand this. Uh, and as he went on, he said, I challenge you as architects to see if you can think about designing and building in a different way. That, you know, these buildings don't last forever. They, they consume incredible amounts of energy depending on uh, how much glass you have and how they're oriented and, and so on. They fill up our land our landfills with, with construction waste. Something like half of the, the waste in a landfill comes from construction, which shocked me. And uh, so he challenged us, to, and he said, also, you're using materials now. He talked about the vinyl, the vinyl brick and so on. He says, you're using materials now that uh, aren't made from nature. They're made, they're made artificially, and those will be, uh, some of them, a thousand years to return to some natural state once they've finished their life as part of a building. So he challenged us to, to change our thinking. He didn't use the word sustainable design, and he did use the word ecology a couple of times. It's the first time I ever heard that word. And uh, we were all, the members of the board, there must have been 15 of us, we were all mesmerized by this talk. And my colleague in San Francisco office, Bill Valentine, who was my partner for many, many years and became the design leader of HOK after Gio Obata retired, Bill was particularly taken with this and said, you know what, I think I've discovered my real calling. Uh, I want our buildings to be uh, more and more sustainable. And he made it his business to begin to transform how we thought about designing to, uh, to have sustainability as one of the main drivers. And until that time, uh, sustainability just wasn't thought about. So Bill pushed on this. His successor, Bill Helmuth, who is the nephew of George Helmuth, the founder, um, but from an estranged part of the family, the Helmuth, Bill Helmuth family and the Papa George Helmuth family were not speaking to one another for decades. But Bill Helmuth, Bill Helmuth anyway, uh, Bill Helmuth has taken this on as well. And now, um, you know, and to design sustainably, I will tell you, I'll tell your, your listeners, it is not just wanting to do it. You have to be really smart and clever about it. And if you want to design sustainably, you better learn how to use 3D BIM because if you can't model your building in three dimensions, you can't run a little program that will show you what your heat gain is from when the sun shines. You can't find out what the, the heat load is when the sun is shining in your windows and on and on and on. So uh, that has now become a regular routine in HOK. Each project that we design from the very beginning does monthly reports on sustainability. We have a little form that we've generated. And uh, uh, we will not produce any building that is not at least a lead rated building. And uh, we've now gone beyond that. We think that the place we, where architects can reclaim some of this lost ground is by, de by designing buildings that are zero net energy and zero carbon buildings. Those are high lofty goals we have to be more and more thoughtful about design, but we've actually begun to make real inroads. Yeah, no, I, uh, I have a few clients that are extremely technically advanced and uh, very research-based in the projects that they're doing and, and are doing some amazing things. And even to think that a building can passively essentially be its own little power plant 
that doesn't add any any negativity to the environment and and the ecology of of this place we call home is is amazing like i remember when i first started photographing some of these places and it really started to hit me that but you mean this building takes no energy from a grid or anything else and it's normal you know it's not it's not some hippies, you know, in a commune somewhere and just turning on the lights for 25 minutes a night or something. This is a normal building and it's making its own power. We've, we've just, uh, I don't know what the word is, but instead of having a central power system, we've diversified to a degree and made, you know, little power, uh, power generators for each home or, or each building, which is, which is amazing. You know, I'm. Well, and, and that could be, you know, it's just begun to change people's thinking. Uh, yeah. Who would have imagined we would have, until a few years ago, we would have cars that uh, are, that are electric cars that 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 don't compromise, that they're they're beautiful, they're big, they're comfortable, and uh, uh, they're selling like hotcakes. That's that's why you know Tesla has such a high stock value. That here's a guy audacious enough to say, this is the right thing to do, and I'm going to make a great product that is yeah. that is uh, sustainable. Um, and uh, so we can do that too. Let me just say, if you just talk about energy consumption for a minute, because it's pretty easy to get on a soapbox about this. What generates, the, what uses the biggest amount of energy in our in our uh, in our uh, country today? Well, I will give you the answer. It's buildings. They the buildings use more energy today. Houses, buildings, schools, hospitals, everything put together. More, use more energy than all the cars and trucks and airplanes and trains and boats, all the transportation energy combined. Close to half of the energy that's consumed in this country is consumed by buildings. Why is that? Well, one good reason is that buildings are horribly inefficient, traditionally, uh, wasteful of energy. But the other one is, think about it, buildings are always on. You've always got heat on or air conditioning on or some lights on or the computers that you're using in your home or you're cooking or you're running the washing machine or etc. Buildings are always on. Cars and trucks are either on or they're off. So um, we as architects have a mission if we chose to accept it. And I, I would encourage any small firm to consider specializing in highly sustainable design. It's, it's, the trick is to really get good enough at it so that, as you said, Trent, buildings are normal. They're not a hippie commune out in the woods. They're regular normal places for people that want to live well, but want to live sustainably. Hmm. Yeah, my wife is actually going through the process of getting solar for our house right now. We, we kind of got our house finished and the first floor finished and we lived all four of us in like the office downstairs until we finished the upstairs. And now that we finished the upstairs, we bought a boat, <laughs> but we're, uh, we're kind of building the structure for a garage that we're going to put solar on. And I've been, I've been kicking against it because I'm cheap and selfish and she has a real, <laughs> um, she has real passion to be off grid and and have a lot of gardening and everything else and this is good this is helping me kind of see the light and and realize you know this is a good thing to invest in and financially even for my cheap side it, it makes pretty good sense that we're going to get that money back in not having an electric bill over time well so. that's right you get a payback most states i don't know about maine but most states have uh some kind of rebate or tax credit program yep. and solar panels solar voltaics have become much less expensive and 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 somewhat more efficient. Yeah. Uh, I will tell you, if you put them on your roof, that's great. You do have to wash them. Hmm. Uh, you have to you have to get the dust off if you want to keep them at a, at an efficient rate. So uh, you have to put them on a roof in some way that you can you or some lucky person gets to go up and and at least hose them down if not right. squeegee them down. All right, that that's a good uh, professional tip there from someone in the industry. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Um, okay. So, uh, next question I got here, uh, and this, this is out of my wheelhouse and something I need to learn the difference between leading and managing, and especially in your scenario where it comes to leading or managing creative types, 
that's yes. probably a little bit more of free radicals wandering around in the office that they're a little bit different personality type but what's what's your experience and the uh, difference in those that's an excellent question that was probably the most difficult challenge for me to learn you know uh, let me start back as i'm an architect i love architecture i went to architecture school uh, i studied for five years i went to europe and studied and i came back and got a master's degree in urban design in all of those times seven years of work of study i got one course in architectural practice taught by a professor who had never practiced so uh, i was not equipped to uh, manage or lead or run a firm or all the tools that people need uh, because we all come out of school idealistically wanting to be great designers wanting to do great work but how do we organize ourselves and how do we collect money from clients the basics of that um, so i had to learn that and i transitioned from being a designer um, bill valentine and my bosses at the time this is maybe 10 years on into my HOK career out of 50, they came to me, uh, called me into Bill's office and said, you know, you're a designer and you're a good designer, but you also show great promise as a manager. You seem to like organizing your projects, even though that's not been your primary job. Would you like to consider moving to the management side? And I said, well, what about design? And said, well, you'll still be able to work with the project designer and influence the design, but you won't be responsible for design. You'll be responsible for delivering that design to the client on time and on budget and uh, coordinating the work of the consultants to support the great design and so on. And I thought about it for a while and finally decided, yes, it was actually quite satisfying. So I found I was, I my tendencies were to be naturally organized. Um, but, uh, the last thing I wanted to do was start giving designers orders about you have to finish the design by next Tuesday because we're out of money. That if you want to strike a death blow to great design, that's what you that's what you do. So you have to work with people to the, 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 the definition of leadership. There are two good ones. One is that leaders have followers. If you're not a leader, unless you have followers, people who will follow you to the jaws of hell if necessary. And the other one is from Dwight Eisenhower, is that the job of the leader is to get people to want to do the things that the leader wants them to do in the first place. In other words, to inspire people to do the right thing, not tell them to do it. It's a tricky long thing. There's a lot of long thing in the book about it. Um, but leaders, uh, for those who are parents in the in the audience, including myself and you, Trent. Uh, leaders are a lot, it's a lot like parenting. You want your children to grow up to be strong, uh, self-reliant, uh, 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 mature adults. You don't want to smother them with do this and do that to the point that they're robots. So you, it's a nurturing kind of, of, uh, of leadership. There are times, there are times when you have to say no, no ice cream until you finish your homework or whatever it is. But most of the time, it's helping them to learn what to do. And a good leader doesn't sit in an office and issue orders. A good leader is out in the studio working with teams and asking a thousand questions. Uh, what is it that's hanging this project up? Uh, have you, is, is there an issue with the coordination with the engineers? Uh, is there a budget issue with this? How are you doing with your sustainability metrics? And asking the questions and then getting people to giving people permission to speak honestly. Cause you know, when the boss comes around, if the boss is intimidating, people will clam up and you won't get anywhere. So you have to get people to want to talk to you about things and see that you're the best leader is a servant leader. I'm here to help you do your job. I'm not here to tell you what to do. Uh, I had to learn that and it took me, time. There was a period of time that HOK thought I was a pretty good leader, but a little overbearing. And the HR director came and said, Patrick, we think you could be a real firm-wide leader someday, but uh, but you've got some rough edges. So we want to send you to 
um, um, to a management school. You, and I said, oh, you mean a charm school? I still call it charm school to this day, but good leaders explain not just to do something, but why something is important. If you tell people why, and they, re and you, they really hear you, then they will get on your team and begin to do things because they understand. So um, um, it's a job that's never done. Uh, leadership is always a challenge, and especially in a firm where creative work is going on. It's probably the most challenging and difficult, but one of the most exhilarating things that, that anyone can learn. I did not learn this at school. I learned it the hard way on the job. <laughs> well, it's... Uh... I've I've heard key terms. I've uh, my I've heard my dad talk a lot about uh, servant leadership, and I've experienced what you're talking about uh, through seeing my my vast uh, variety of shortcomings, if you will. <laughs> like uh, with with my two boys, if I'm telling them what to do all day while trying to get my own thing done, if if I'm with the children that day for some reason. If my, my wife will go to continuing education in Michigan for a little bit, I'm with the kids for like a week stretch. At the end of the day, if I've told them what to do all day while I'm trying to get stuff done, at the end of the day, when I put them to bed, it's a different feeling and it's a different child than if I spend the day with them involved in what they're doing and direct and lead them through relationship and being present and being asking questions, being curious about what they're doing and being involved in that. When I put that child to bed at night, there's nothing but love and hugs and a very well-behaved child because they've caught what I, what I hope they will become rather than, you know, told them what they need to do and what they become. And that, that seems to be true within what you're saying within uh, leadership rather than management. It's an inspiring towards the end goal rather than dictating towards an end goal. In, in fact, Trent, uh, I think you've got it just right. Why is it in the practice of architecture we call people project managers or we call people office managers or managing principals, mm -hmm. managing partners? That's uh, our director of interiors, or director of this and that. We don't actually direct or manage anything. Uh, if we're good at what we do, we lead. We lead. We engage with our people. The servant leadership idea, let me just give you one other mental image here. The normal organizational chart that we've all seen is a bunch of boxes with the top bosses at the top of the pyramid, and there are more boxes in each row, and it makes a pyramid. Yep. So the big boss is up there, and the, the idea of that is the big boss gives uh, direction to the ones below him or her, and then they give direction all the way down to the poor suckers that are at the bottom of that pyramid that are taking orders from everybody. Hmm. And the reality is just the opposite. We, um, I created a pyramid for the HOK structure, it's a, and it's a pyramid, again, using that building form that the Egyptians first used. And the base of the pyramid is where all the leaders are holding up the rest of the firm, serving the rest of the firm. Um, that's where leaders, true leaders belong. True leaders should be servants. Uh, the true leaders should not be dictators. It never works, especially, maybe it works if you're making widgets. I don't know. But it sure as heck doesn't work if you're, if you're in a creative process. If you really yeah, want, pe uh, if you want people to be something besides robots, uh, you've got yeah. to be a helpful leader that serves their needs. If, if you're doing a great job, if your people are all, and I can tell it when I walk into an office, if the, if the office is led by people like that, the office has a buzz. If I walk into an office that's unnaturally quiet, people are afraid to speak out and say things because the leader might take their head off. Yeah. It's easy once you see it. Yeah. It's more so you walk in and you see all the bricks are exactly the same and the grout is perfect. It's this is not true and this is not living and real. There's no rough edges that that add to the complexity and organic reality of truth that we know. Yeah. That's that, a good yeah. that's a good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of to a degree, uh company culture, that kind of is a good segue into the next question. How do you how to maintain 
and reclaim your company culture. And again, I was reading uh, one of your articles last night that had a good antidote, antidote, uh, sorry, uh, of where your, where HOK had kind of gone and I think become a little more competitive even amongst the satellite offices and how you kind of steered that back on course to a degree. Yes, that was, uh, you know, when I became, that's a, that's a good story actually. Uh, when I first joined HOK, it was one office and the three founders were so aligned of how the, what they wanted the office to feel like inside. One of my friends who went there, went to work a year before I did, uh, said, you're going to love it. It's like a big family. People help each other to succeed. What I learned was there was uh, the, the whole office got together regularly, Friday nights and so on, have a beer, uh, and people would be singled out for praise. Patrick did a good job on building the model for the such and so project. Joe over there made the deadline um, and pulled the extra time, you know, worked all night to, to make the deadline on that on his project and so on. If there was criticism to be made, that was never done in public. It was always behind closed doors privately. And it wasn't you know, you stupid idiot. It was, you know, you did this. We don't think that's the right way. Here's the right way. Why don't you go out and try again? It was helpful criticism. That's the culture I came into. As HOK grew from one office too quickly, actually, to many, and today there are 27 locations around the world. Uh, uh, at first, we put HOK people from St. Louis in the new offices, people like me. Uh, Bill Valentine and I came from St. Louis to San Francisco to open this office. And we brought that HOK culture with us. That's what we called it, HOK culture. Bill Valentine talked about, with our new employees in San Francisco, vaccinating them with HOK culture. That is, we're a big family. We help each other to succeed. We don't compete internally. We collaborate. Here's the saying behind it. We collaborate inside the firm in order to compete better outside the firm. There's plenty of competition outside. Why have it inside? Well, that worked for a while, but pretty soon, poor St. Louis HOK didn't have enough people to keep populating these new offices. So new people were hired and they came out with, they came into the firm with no knowledge of what HOK culture was. And uh, after the founders began to uh, George Kassebaum died in 82. Uh, George Helmuth retired after a while and so on. They didn't know who the founders were. They didn't know about HOK culture. I did because I had lived it. So we had offices beginning to do the things that are so deadly to a large firm, which is compete with one another. Oh, um, yes, I think, you know, an office would call on a client and find, oh, yes, you're, I, I, HOK, I know that name. There was another HOK office that just called on me last week. Competing for s same work. Yes. Yeah. Uh, offices competing for the same work. Um, for a while, there was talk of drawing a map and putting lines on the map. Who, who, gets, uh, who gets the state of uh, Pennsylvania? Is it St. Louis or is it New York? Kind of thing. Where do you draw that line? We resisted that saying, that's not the kind of firm we want. We don't want to have bright lines defining where you can go. We want everybody to be able to go to follow clients anywhere. But it meant that they had to be collaborative in, inside the firm. So how did we change it? Well, that's a long story, but here's basically what we did. We were incentivizing our leaders in the different offices incorrectly. We gave them salaries and annual bonuses based on how much fee and profit they made. For that, for that satellite firm or office? Yes, and office. yes, we called them branches, branch offices. And uh, so if, uh, if New York made a big profit, the New York leadership got big bonuses and the people in the New York office got bonuses. And uh, if New York could get a little bit more fee and a little bit more profit at, at uh, HOK Washington DC's expense, well, that's fine, they got even bigger bonuses. So there was no incentive from our bonus or our compensation uh, strategy, there was no incentive to be collaborative. There was also no incentive 
for great design. It was just pure no dollars in numbers. So we had basically an accounting formula that ran the firm instead of what we really wanted. So when I became CEO, we finally changed that. We took all of the leaders of offices and leaders of what we call our market practices, aviation, healthcare, justice, uh, sports architecture, and so on. All of those people were put into one bonus basket. And we said the executive committee, which is a group of five or six people at the top of the firm, I'm with me as the head of that, we're going to set your bonus, you 80 people, completely independent of what your office does. We'll set another bonus for your office, but we're going to bonus you as an office leader on three things, maybe four. One is, yes, are you profitable? Two, how collaborative are you? Have you been helping another office win that next job? Have you been sharing your talented people with another office so that they can actually grow up and get stronger? So are you collaborative? Three, are you, are you, are you holding up the banner for good design, uh, good quality design, sustainable design, or are you just making a fast buck? Uh, those qualitative measures finally began to sink in to the leaders that said, oh, I'm actually bonused based on my behavior as a leader, not just on, how, on some mathematical formula. So once we got the math out of it, uh, yes, it meant more work for the executive committee. We had to review uh, each member of that leadership group. Each one of us took on the job of giving that person, one of those 80 people, the annual review. So each one of us had five or 10 or 15 people to review each year. It was our job to give them that guidance and our job to tell them whether they were doing a good job and what their bonus was. After we got that in place, things began to change. And once the leaders were aligned, and again, the leaders are down in the base of that pyramid with, with, uh, with me, then it trickled up to everybody else in the staff because people could see the difference in how they were being led. It wasn't, we're going to compete against those so-and-sos in HOK New York. It's, how can we help people in New York get that next job? Or how can they help us get our next job? So it turned, but it took, Trent, I think that whole process uh, took the longest. Uh, I had three big jobs to, to, to do. One was to get the operations just to be really top notch, uh, making money, collecting fees, housekeeping stuff. Uh, the second was to get people to be good collaborators. That took 10 years, maybe, maybe nine, to really nail it all. Again, collecting everybody together uh, from around the world and making, making everybody feel the same about the firm. We also used firm-wide retreats. Uh, we did uh, three or four of those where we'd have, we couldn't have the whole firm, that was too big, but we had uh, 200, 250 people. So that the leaders and secondary leaders, uh, people that were up and coming. Um, and we also glued ourselves together electronically. Uh, everybody at HOK is on the HOK network. Uh, we have very high-end video conference rooms where people can see each other in real size and talk in real time. Uh, we have an intranet, which is an internal website where people can, uh, can uh, get information about others. We found that, for example, once we posted pictures of everybody on the intranet, instead of calling Joe in another office you hadn't met, you went to the internet, you saw a picture of Joe, you read a little bio, where did Joe go to school, uh, what's Joe's last project, and so on and so on, so that you felt as if you were knowing who Joe was before you, or Joetta, before you connected. So uh, it was a lot of hard work, but I'm pleased to say that, um, that that was probably the key to gluing HOK together, is to get people to treat each other as people, as individuals, instead of members from another office, just well, as people. What was, how do you, how do you inspire that to 
like what was the rubber meets the road to actually get people to start to stop thinking of their other branch offices as competition, but actually uh, collaborative? Like, how do you actually do that? Well, um, there there were times, uh, in addition to changing the bonus program, there mm -hmm. were some really hard decisions that we had to make. There were a couple of leaders that absolutely did not want to get together with us on this program. Mm -hmm. The head of our London office, for example, big, big office, had the idea that he wanted to build a network of offices in Europe and sort of stay at an arm's length with the HOK in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I went over personally and sat him down privately, had him come to my hotel and have coffee with me. And uh, by the end of an hour's conversation, it was clear to both of us he didn't belong at HOK. Mm. So uh, there were times when we simply had to say to people, you don't want to do what we stand for. You're in the way of that program. You don't fit with, what, with our goals. You shouldn't be here. So did we, did we fire people? Yes, uh, you could say that. Sometimes people resigned. Sometimes we had to simply fire them. But each time we did, I will say this too, we treated them with respect. We gave them generous severance. We also uh, acted as a reference for them to seek new jobs. Um, we offered uh, after the job training if they wanted to train on how to be a better leader and so on. Mm -hmm. um, because people from the beginning of the firm have been at the center of the firm, the most important piece of our firm. Yeah. Think about it. What else is a firm except people? Yeah. And just even in my tiny thing that I have going on here, the the uh, studio manager I have, Timothy Holt, his his personality and what he does for just a very little, you know, that I do is just, uh, it, it's just so incredibly valuable. Where the the freedom that it gives me to to do these podcasts, think about what I do, uh, to, you know, develop some type of vision for where my business is going and everything else is all because I have people like Tim supporting me, my wife supporting me, my parents giving me what they, you know, gave me. There, there's all these things that support that. And to lose, you know, those most valuable assets would, would just be a, a complete sink the ship. <laughs> Yes, you know, um, I think the other way is there There aren't many lone wolves. Not if many. you look at successful people or successful firms or anything that's successful, it's it's a teamwork. Uh, I like to think of uh, architecture. This sounds very trite, and I, I don't mean it that way. Architecture is a team sport. It takes a lot of people working together to design and deliver top quality work for uh, projects around the country or around the world, helping each other to succeed. And there's enough satisfaction, enough glory in that for everybody on the team, whether they're the person that made the coffee or the person that developed the original concept for the design. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way I think it needs to be. Um, the, the idea of the architect as the lone wolf out there creating something, just think about this. Once you've created this and drawn the drawings or done the computer model, whatever, it goes to a contractor, unless you're a designer builder. And that's involving different trades and different people. Uh, so you're going to lose if you don't find a way to, to, to partner up with even your contract during construction, something will be lost. Something that can add to the mm. final quality of what you're putting together, this creation. So I, I not only encourage teamwork within HOK, I also encourage, and I think this is common sense, teamwork with the, the architect and the contractor. I think design, bid, build is on its way out and more of collaborative arrangements like, uh, like design, build, uh, or uh, integrated project delivery models are better where the contractor and the design team are part of the same team with the owner and going all the way from beginning of programming all the way through to the finished project. Hmm. Now, um, let's move on to some uh, listener questions or 
mostly client questions, clients of mine that are firm leaders that uh, have some some uh, things to pick your brain with. Uh, what is your advice for transitioning from being the design talent that founds a firm to a leader of other design talents? And I think you probably touched on this a little bit, but uh, is there anything else in there in that that difficulty of transition where you founded a firm and it's your baby and you're just you're about design, but you have to hand it over. Yes, of course. I mean, firm transitions, uh, just a broader way to look at that is you started this firm and you're proud of it. You built it. Um, you've got people working there that are also quite talented. Um, don't you want it to continue? Does it does it have to start and stop with you as the founder? Does it start with you and end with you? That's what happened with Helmuth and Helmuth. Um, the right answer here is, I think, to be more like a parent. You, as your children grow, um, you give them more and more freedom to express themselves, more and more opportunity to learn and do things on their own. Um, and uh, finally, uh, you know, after 18 years, if you're lucky, or maybe 21 years, uh, they become self-reliant adults that you're proud of. Well, I think it's kind of like that. If you're a designer in a firm and you want to, the firm to grow and prosper, you take your brightest design helpers and be give, begin to give them an opportunity to try things on their own and make mistakes. Right. If you don't give them the chance to make mistakes, how will they learn? Now, depending on how long the lease you give them, they can learn quickly or not quickly. But if the lease is too short, It'll never work. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I I tend towards an authoritarian parenting type, which is not healthy. And I, I really have to be conscious of that and allow for the freedom to make mistakes and to make things dirty or, or whatever. I mean, just even this morning, we were out fishing and on, on a boat we just bought and I'm, I'm allowing my two boys who are uh, eight and 10 to actually take the dinghy, go out on their own. They've got a little motor and they're just, they feel like they're out, you know, on the great fast sea and they, you know, they go out and do their own little thing. And, and it is apprehensive for me to watch them pull away and, you know, they could gas that thing and head to England and I'd have to, you know, go, catch them. <laughs> you know, but that's, you have to do that. You have to allow that little bit of freedom to like, all right, go do this. And they, they feel that. And I could see it in them when they were motoring away. The, the youngest kind of stood up and did this number. He's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't a, it wasn't a, we're rid of you. It was, they were facing adventure and going out into it. And, and I think there, there's a lot of that, as you're saying with, uh, all right, I'm handing over some responsibility and here you go. I trust you. Do what you can. And I trust you to even fail and do the right thing when you fail, because obviously we're all going to have failures. So that's that's an interesting thing to preempt. Failures are actually, Trent, I think um, some of the biggest uh, some of the biggest learning experiences. How can you how can you improve unless you fail? Yeah. And then you pick yeah. yourself up and try again. Yeah, I, I did a project with prison inmates where we photographed them and had them write in a letter around themselves to their younger self. And it made me realize that it's interesting that we, we have so much to share from a real experience of failure. There's so much. If you can acknowledge your part in that failure, what you've learned from it and how you've improved, there's nothing more powerful than that to hand that to someone else. And it was sad for me to see that the inmates that we did work with, which were very few from a vast population, uh, of the 12 that we worked with, I'd say eight of them had actually owned their part of that and had grown from it and had just an immense amount of life experience to hand off to other people who would potentially be in their same situation that had the same background as them, but they were not able to utilize or share that uh, in a way that would benefit the people who needed to hear it because they were simply locked up. And there was an interesting contrast there that I, I, I hope I shed some light on and I hope something comes of that. But yeah, the, the failures are so valuable. 
Well, and let me tell you the big payoff with that, not not necessarily with the prisoners, but with uh, our young architects or designers that you're mentoring in a firm, you will find, uh, almost without question, that some of these younger people will turn out to be very, very good at something, probably better than you. Mm. I know it's hard to imagine, <laughs> but it does happen all yep. the time. Uh, if you give them the, the encouragement and give them enough room to make those mistakes, they have to have that encouragement um, and patience in order to really spring free and be free to make those errors and be free to learn from those errors and grow. Yeah. But once you do that, you've got yourself the prospect of having a partner in your hands right? or somebody who's really much better at you than something and they can bring the firm in a new direction. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I have another thought in the back of my head that we'll come to in a, in a second. But um, <laughs> uh, another, another question I had here from another client, uh, with the scale of HOK's work and its emphasis on BIM, what role has hand drawing played in HOK's design process? And this is from a client of mine who's an insanely talented uh, sketch artist uh, designer, Russ Tyson. But yes, okay, that's a, that's an excellent question, and um, you might imagine that I've heard that one before. Here's how, uh, and and the HOK where I began was of course all drawing by hand, including sketching, and I've got pretty pretty decent hands too. I still sketch. I still noodle on, on paper. Um, uh, Gio Obata, the, 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 the O of HOK, used to say to his design team, there's a, there's a certain connection between the hand and the eye and the brain. And if you're working with your hands to sketch a building, or if you're working with your hands to build a little study model of something, you, your brain will then understand it better than if you just sketch it if you're making a model, or certainly, he would have said, or if you're simply using a computer and a mouse and a keyboard, because that connection tends to get broken. So most HOK designers today do all three. Uh, they sketch, they work on the computer, uh, and they build models by hand at their desks, little ones. We also make, you know, people, we have 3D printers, in every office, and somebody will decide on a shape or a form for a building, stick it on the 3D printer at night, come back in the morning and see a little model of their building. But that those things, while they're cool, don't nourish that hand-eye-brain connection. The only way that I know to do it is to do is to continue to use the hands to hold something besides a mouse, you know, to hold a pencil or a pen. Um, my personal favorite is the Pentel pen, probably like so many people. But the, that allows your brain to quickly explore options. And the computer, I think, while some of our younger designers are almost exclusively on the computer, and I think they've almost developed that connection between the hand and the mouse and the screen and the brain, where they're, okay. where they're engaged in creation with their brain. Uh, but... Don't be fooled. The computer is a good sharp pencil, but you need to have that connection. The, 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 the real key to everything is your brain. What's your brain seeing and telling you that you're seeing? And what is what are your hands helping you to see? So that, that create, creative process is probably all of the above. Uh, we still have a lot of people in the firm who who uh, won't do a building won't until they build a study model by themselves usually with some kind of thin cardboard, just with masking tape or T-pins to glue it, to stick it together so they can kind of see how a form might be. Uh, and uh, you don't see that in the finished result. You see the slick models and the beautiful fly-through renderings and all that stuff. But the, the beginning of a design process is still very much like it was 50 or 100 years ago. Now, the, the easy segue now is the top three benefits and drawbacks of BIM. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, well, I think uh, BIM is here to stay. Um, I cannot imagine going away. So here's, here's the benefits. Um, BIM is 
at, at its most basic, BIM allows us to, you know, think about this. I grew up and was trained to, to uh, visualize a three-dimensional building on two-dimensional pieces of paper. That was hard. It was hard to do and to have to interpret a floor plan or a building section um, and, and, and try to understand what the finished building would be like. So the computer, first of all, does help us visualize three-dimensional geometry uh, pretty effectively. And the software has gotten so much better, better and better and better. So we can see more how our, the form of our buildings, the shape, the size of the building, the rooms, and so on, work. Um, that's a huge help. The second thing is that, that uh, without BIM software, you cannot, I don't care what you say, you cannot design deep green. Uh, you need to have that detailed information about the geometry of the building and its orientation to the sun and the wind and so on to know and to, and to bring in a weather model for uh, what the climate is and where that building is located in order to really, really design deep green. You cannot do it with 2D uh, drawing. You just can't. You can approximate it, but you'll end up using rules of thumb, which are uh, okay, but they're not good enough detail these days. Not if you want to do deep green. And the third big benefit of BIM is not yet apparent to most people, but it's coming. And that is buildings um, are made up of thousands of manufactured products, and uh, how many doors and how many windows and uh, what, what kinds of doors and windows and when can they be shipped and how much do they weigh and what's their U value and um, what do they cost and so on and so on. There's an ocean, literally an ocean, probably the Atlantic Ocean, not big enough, it's probably the Pacific Ocean worth of data that architects are using, but we don't quite know it yet that everything that goes into a building, these thousands of parts and pieces, have to be made somewhere. They have to be priced. They have to fit and coordinate with each other. They have to be shipped to the job site. The contractor has to order them, pay for them, get them shipped in the correct order. Then they have to be assembled on the site. The contractors are not so much constructing buildings these days as assembling them on site of parts and pieces that are made in a factory someplace. So that ocean of information will become ever more uh, valuable to interchange the right information between the, the design team, the, the, the architect and the engineers, the owner's team, and the contractor's team with all the subs and the suppliers that supply all the parts and pieces. Yes, there's still some construction to be done, especially when you're digging in the dirt and putting in your foundations and so on. But even that, BIM has pretty much taken hold there. So, uh, and there's even BIM now, There's there are links to BIM and GIS, which is geospatial. Where on the planet are you? How do you hook up to the street grid or the electric grid or the, uh, the utility grids and so on? Um, so um, it's here to stay and, and uh, um, we're gonna have to be more and more adept at using it, fortunately, Software is getting easier and better, so it's not so blooming complicated. You don't have to have a PhD in computer science to 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 uh, work these. I've heard architect friends of mine say that the newer softwares free me up to be an architect again. I don't have to think about the computer. I can think about creating a design that works. And then there are, because of BIM software, there are literally, first there were dozens, now there are thousands of little software apps that you can get, uh, anybody can get, um, that allow you to do a little piece of work. Um, what's the heat gain gonna be through that through that wall? Uh, how much energy can I save if I put the windows here instead of there? Um, what's the acoustic value of if you're doing buildings or condos or something that are close together? What's the, what, what, what's the sound transmission value through a certain wall assembly? And can I make it better if I add another layer of sheetrock or what have you? So these little software pieces allow us to fine-tune our work and make a better building because we're making we're 
we're, we're getting better information early when we need to, uh, during, even during schematic design, which is part of the MacLamy curve. I don't know if we want to talk about that today, but that's almost another, that's another hour's worth. But architects need to get on this, the idea that we're not designing uh, for this, you know, a lot of architects rush through schematic design so they can save their fee for the big job, which is the, the documentation of the work. That's backwards, folks. We need to work mostly in, des in design and let the softwares take care of the complexity that we used to do in working drawings and use the software to our advantage to have better, more refined designs. Better, much better. Uh, now, those are all the advantages. What are the disadvantages? Well, you have to learn it. You have to learn how to do it. And that's probably the biggest hurdle, especially for people over a certain age, I'd say 30. The young people in our firm, in HOK, and young people probably in any office who grew up with computers around them find it, well, of course this is the way it works. Of course this is how you do it. And so if you want to find out how to operate a CAD software or a BIM software, rather, ask the young people in the office, they can show you. So I think uh, learning to master that is, is, uh, is something that people will have to go through. Um, you can't avoid it if you want to have a sustainable practice, I don't think. Um, but uh, gradually we're making this transition to uh, people getting used to working with the computer and BIM software and, and take, tackling the, the sometimes bewildering array of choices we have with the software. Um, I think getting trained up is, uh, and that's, that's a disadvantage, I guess. Although once you're trained, it's not. And then it never, it never stays the same. Once I knew how to draw by hand, it kind of stayed the same. I might have changed out my pencil for, actually I changed out uh, sheets of paper for Mylar, which was a lot easier and I could erase it better. But the computer programs change all the time. They have new versions. They have bug fixes. They have patches. So you have to stay up with it. There's no way around that. So that's maybe another disadvantage that uh, it's a learning business. You have to learn how to use it. You have to learn how to play the piano, the computer piano, and be a virtuoso. If you do, you can be, uh, you can it, can, it can be incredibly helpful. If you're intimidated by it or you haven't mastered it, it seems like you're climbing Mount Everest. It really isn't, but it does seem like it. I get that. And um, what's the third disadvantage? Some people think that computers are expensive and the software, they keep nicking you for, now they're not selling software to you, you're renting it. Yeah. And, uh, right. And you have to pay pay up every month or every quarter or every every year, whatever it is. And uh, isn't that expensive? And I wish I didn't have to do that. And I didn't make much money this quarter, so I think I just won't rent that particular piece of software. I think that's uh, if you're in that position, um, you're not looking at it correctly. The really expensive part of running any design practice is people. And if the computer up-to-date computer with up-to-date software with enough processing power and a big enough screen, you can, you can do magic. And so if you're not giving people that advantage of that best technology can give, you're not treating your people well enough. So just remember, people are expensive. Technology, even though it costs some money, is, by, is the sharpest pencil you can possibly get your hands on. Right. Yeah, we did... Um... We did a marketing piece for New Forma that kind of uh, interacts with BIM overall. And uh, it was amazing to hear the stories of how building information modeling, that's what BIM stands for, correct? Uh, actually saved the day in so many different ways. And, you know, to, to be able to, with uh, this New Forma program, they'd you know, send an update or they'd just walk into a space and be able to photograph it and then pin it to a certain part of the drawing. And then that communicates to the contractor. And then you have a record that the contractor actually saw that. And so they can't say, I never saw that. And it, it's, uh, it, it's just getting better. It seems it, it, 
as you said, you know, it's a computer program to learn, but it's, it's maximizing technology for the parts where technology can be very precisely effective and intelligent in freeing up humans to do what humans are actually good at, the design and the creation. So, I think, actually, you said a really important thing, Trent. The computer is our servant. It's not our master. If you, if you can get your head around that, we're the masters. Your brain is far more adaptive and creative than the computer, even the fastest, best computers. What the computer can do as our servant is take a lot of what I would call the tedium out of architecture. And architects have traditionally not been very good at tedious stuff. Um, and so, you know, uh, adding up dimension strings in the old days before the computer was a tedious exercise. I was really happy that the computer does that for me. Uh, you hit the button and there you go. So if you use it properly, it's a fantastic servant uh, and frees you up as the architect to be more creative and more thoughtful in serving your client and creating something wonderful. Yeah. Um, one of my close to last questions here, we've been going for about an hour and 45 minutes and it's gone by really quick. Um, what project have you been most, what project has been the most fulfilling for you to be a part of and why? Um, uh. Well, I can, I can answer it in a couple of different ways. Um, um, if, I, if I answered it the way Gio Obata would answer it, and he's the only founder still living, he would, he would always say when people ask him that, the most important project to me is the one I'm working on now, which is a pretty good answer because when you're involved and engaged in a project, it's all-consuming. You're totally into it. Um, if I take some historical perspective and look back, um, there are a couple of projects that stand out for me. Uh, one is the project where I really, it all came together for me and I finally reached a level of maturity as a project manager, the Moscone Convention Center in San Francisco. Massive project um, where I was the project manager. We were in a, uh, the, the building is large uh, to build a new convention center in San Francisco. As usual in San Francisco, there were people that didn't want the project to be built. And so there was political opposition. We were in a pressure cooker. We had a, we, uh, we had a boss from the city that was tough as nails. Used to, he was a tank commander for General George Patton during World War II. Um, and, uh, uh, but I learned how design and delivery of the work and working with a contractor could actually result in something wonderful. The building has been a top success. It transformed an area of town we called South of Market into from an old shipping and warehouse section of district of town to now what's called South of Market area, Soma, which is vibrant. Uh, we also designed the, the new, now not so new, but so wonderful baseball park for the Giants called Pac Bell Park in the early days, um, which is recognized as one of the best stadiums ever. So now that that project was transformative for a whole part of San Francisco, and it's where I learned what it was like to put a whole project together. More recently, uh, I think that the project that's, that I got very involved in uh, late in my career was the the, the reimagining of LaGuardia Airport in New York City. LaGuardia was called by Vice President Joe Biden a third world airport because it was undersized, it was old, uh, everything was inadequate about it. Uh, the, there was no room for the planes to taxi, the runways were short, and it was so low that uh, when a hurricane came through and New York Harbor flooded and the, the, the airport, the runway was underwater, and all the electrical substations were buried in the ground. They all, they all shorted out because they were flooded with water. So um, HOK is, was part of a team to do a design build new airport, new terminal uh, for the airport. And uh, the innovation there was that everything is up in the air. The new terminal is in front of the old one. 
And instead of going through tunnels to, to satellite terminals, there are these beautiful, graceful bridges that actually span over the old terminal, which will be demolished once, once everything is in place, to new satellite terminals. When you go across those bridges, which are 400 and some feet long, the planes actually taxi under you. It's the first airport in the world that does that. And you get these smash hit views of Manhattan skyline as you go to yeah. and from your flight. Um, uh, that's a, making an airport a noble place instead of feeling like you're going through a, a, some kind of a stockyard or you're a cow and you're being led to slaughter. That, that actually it's a noble experience to go through a building like that that's been thought out where this, uh, there's room to breathe and uh, there's room for people to, to go through the airport without feeling like a sardine. So um, I love that project. There, uh, that, there are many others that I love, uh, but I, the, the best design I got to do was to design HOK. I got to design the HOK that was started by the founders but needed my help to make it the firm it is today. Um, my last question, we, we kind of already uh, touched on, but the, the technological innovations in uh, the architectural world have been, you know, a really steep uh, climb of, of improvement and innovation and everything else. Um, the, the, I wouldn't say transfer of ownership or leadership, but uh, the, the stepping into positions of leadership has been more glacial as far as diversification of people types, uh, the sexes and everything else in the positions of leadership. And what at HOK, what has been the, the, the approach and the policy to encourage that kind of diversification and growth in that way? Yes. Okay. That's an excellent question, Trent. Um, well, first, let me just remind you and your listeners that HOK was um, ahead of its time, even in the even in the fifties, when the firm was started, nineteen fifty five, one of the original partners, Gio Obata, was Japanese American. Uh, the other two were Caucasian Americans, but really good people. Um, even in the earliest days of the firm, the uh, the firm always was was dedicated to supporting the profession and supporting our people. Uh, the firm from the earliest days gave scholarships to young black people that worked for the firm, starting as office boys, gave them scholarships to go back to architecture school to study up and actually rejoin the firm as junior architects. Some of them, some of them spent their entire careers. So that was in the early days. There were still almost no women in the practice except uh, secretaries and accountants, um, Today, uh, the firm is very distinctly and decidedly um, half and half, men and women. Uh, you can find people of every stripe and color um, and every sexual orientation, for that matter, in the firm, and many in positions of leadership. The, the, uh, many of the, the, the biggest offices, our, our Washington, D.C. office, one of our most successful, is led by a woman. Uh, we have women on our board of directors and women in the executive committee. Minorities, it's a slower climb, but we actively go out and recruit people uh, from universities. We'll typically partner up with the universities near our major offices. So, for example, in San Francisco, we go to Berkeley and we go to Cal Poly. And we recruit people to come to us as paid interns in summertime. We literally recruit people and we always have paid our, our interns. And you know, it's good business. We get to pay them a small amount of money, but we're still paying them. They get this great experience of working for a big firm and we get to take a look at them. Do they have the, what it takes to be a member of HOK? Many of those interns then are given job offers when they finish school. And many have joined us and, and have done, you know, done very well in the firm. So we have actively been recruiting uh, minority students and students in general from universities from the very beginnings of the firm. And we do that today. That's a regular routine of our uh, practice. We typically will, 
We'll connect our HR department, which does the recruiting, with younger employees that are recent graduates of these schools. They will go to the schools, reconnect with the professors, and uh, at the appropriate days, go to job fairs and so on, and interview students that might be interested in joining as, in, as interns. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that process will stop. Again, we're around the world. So our Hong Kong office, for example, has people from, oh gosh, everywhere. Uh, they're mostly Chinese, but uh, there are people from Europe, people from North America, people from Africa, and people from other countries in Asia. And that's pretty typical. We've adopted English as our common language for the firm, but the office in Hong Kong, uh, people know that they need to speak a couple of dialects of Chinese to serve their clients, and that's, that's as it should be. Hmm. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's a mindset, it's an attitude hmm. that, well, you better go do something about this. If our focus has always been on people from the beginning of the firm, I think it's not a long reach to see that focusing on people who can add to the firms, the, the richness of the fabric in the firm, it's a diversity of a different type than Helmuth originally envisioned, but he would have loved it hmm. to find men and women and minorities, people of all kinds, uh, working together on teams to serve our clients. That was and still is the heart of our firm. That's great. Well, um, it's been a really, real pleasure to talk to you and, and to hear, uh, you know, to really actually be able to talk to someone who's been in, in a position of leadership for such a, such a uh, influential company uh, that's had an influence on our built environment, our society, and everything else. And to go through the projects on HOK's website is just amazing, just amazing work. Uh, really, really beautiful stuff. So um, congratulations on an incredible career and congr congratulations on your book. I imagine this has been uh, at a minimum three years of writing and now to get to publishing and doing book tour and everything else. Uh, congratulations on that. Thank you. Actually, I, I tell people it took me 53 years to write the book. The first 50 years was figuring out what to write. And then the next three was writing and editing. But every word in it is mine. Uh, the only thing I did not design was the cover. That was designed by Wiley and Sons, but I had some influence on the cover design. Well, as any So I'm very happy with it. <laughs> well, congratulations and thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. I really appreciate it. And it's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Trent. I've enjoyed every minute. <laughs>